let's let's just take a minute to to thank those folks too. A couple of folks um, in the hiring manager side uh, joined very last minute. Uh, Michael Flores, if you could raise your hand from American Express, thank you. I've seen Michael around at a lot of events over time, uh, presenting and joining and just being around. You do um, it the day or the day after, preferably the day. <laughs> Is that the way to do it? Okay, maybe this was right on track then. But Michael, uh, yeah, thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, another one is uh, one of my GoDaddy co-workers, Shannon Weber. If you are out there, raise your hand. Maybe she's off camera. I'm looking. There's a lot of folks here. There she Hi. is. Yeah. And uh, she was another uh, zero day person that just volunteered to jump in last minute. Um, and I really appreciate that. Alan Basha, one of my longtime associates who I've worked on and off uh, in UX and other fields with uh, over the years is on. Alan, raise your hand. There he is, the one with the wine and the headset, probably most styling guy of the group right now. You know, he's going to be answering honestly when the time comes. Um, and uh, Matt, do we have any others? Um, I, I think is, is Danny on? Danny Robles? I'm not sure if he's here yet. Um, he'll, he'll sneak on probably later. But Awesome. And I think you're going to, there's probably others out there who are going, hey, I'm joining this, but I, I'm in a hiring position as well. I know Matt and myself, in fact, I'm interviewing for people right now. Um, so we'll talk a little bit and then uh, we'll field some questions uh, from, the, uh, from the panel group here, just kind of whatever this raises um, as we go along. Let me share, uh-oh, host has disabled participant sharing. So I need you to allow me to share here. Yep, got it. We're just going to hit every pitfall we can on the way here today. And <laughs> I never remember how to do it. Multiple for one part. Got it. Got it. All Thanks. right. And there it is. Okay. So let's go over here. And I'm going to start, start sharing my screen. All right. Are you seeing the UX and AZ careers in UX screen? Yes, sir. All right, there we go. So official greeting to everybody. I'm Tony Kuros, uh, Director of CX Strategy at GoDaddy. I love this job. I've been here about four years. I came at a time that GoDaddy was trying to make and is still actually making a pretty big shift in its brand and in, 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 in really the, um, the value that we're offering to customers out there, um, moving from domains, cheap domains and hosting to really being a full powered solution uh, for small business. Um, I get to work on changing the brand uh, on you know, a lot of things around the customer, our segmentation, our journeys, uh, do a lot of competitive analysis and benchmarking, work with teams in, in, in many capacities, sometimes uh, bringing in customer focus and insights from these research and sessions, other times doing active um, workshops, and then you know, actual experience design. There's some of that in there as well. In my past, uh, I've had a privilege actually of doing a lot of different types of things from the early days of a webmaster to specialized positions in UX, um, to running teams, global teams of UX, and then uh, experience and strategy agency side. Um, actually, one of the ways this came up is that as a group, I've, I've attended UX and AZ for a while, and we were talking about you know trying to understand what it's like to work in many different uh, types of companies and who could talk about that. And I think Matt said, well, geez, Tony could talk about that. Yeah. And uh, probably some of you on the line as well. And so the, the careers in UX talk though, actually, I first gave this um, last month, I think it was last month, might've been a little bit longer over at ASU. And um, so I kind of recrafted this a little bit for the UX and AZ audience, but basically, you know, um, there, were, there were folks getting ready for graduation and um, Susan Squire over there asked me about coming in to speak to folks. And I thought back to what it was like when I started my career. And frankly, my story is a lot like the game of Plinko here. Sorry for the old reference, but that little pink uh, disc in the middle kind of drops through all of these pegs and eventually lands somewhere, Lord knows where. It's all a game of chance, right? And when I started off my career, all I knew is I really liked working and designing websites and designing with technology. I was at Borders and I was doing websites on the side for bands. I had a, a zine and things going on. And through that network, I got somebody who hired me um, at the Daily Racing Forum, which had an outlet here in Phoenix. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm designing like banners for Yahoo. I'm doing web pages. I'm doing all kinds of stuff, coding. 
And uh, it didn't really occur to me until probably six months in the job that, wow, I'm working in advertising. That's what I'm actually doing here. Um, and after some time with them, um, you know, family situation came up. I actually needed to, to relocate back to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where I was originally born. And I'm looking for something where I can take this web stuff that I love and, and do more of it. So I found a company I hired on. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm getting, you know, great opportunities. I'm designing for brands like Coach and Eddie Bauer and Crate and Barrel. I'm like, wow, how did this happen? This is great. Well, I didn't realize it at the time, but I signed on with a really good digital agency. And uh, I just wanted to keep working in web. Um, life changes happened again, getting married, looking to buy a house. We decided we're going to come back to Arizona and, um, I found a job. Um, and this was not quite the same because they didn't have the agency thing that I was doing in Arizona. Um, but I found uh, a place called, uh, Sage Software it was ACT at the time. And I started designing and doing work with them. And I actually, uh, started a, a, a team over there. And that's where I met Alan, by the way. But every one of those decisions was seat of the pants. It was what's out there. Let me apply. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. I didn't make any calculated moves, like thoughtful moves, I think, in the career until later on. We mentioned mythology, GoDaddy. I had reasons for making those choices. And so calculated moves is what I was thinking about um, when I thought about these students, about people starting careers in UX or making career changes in UX. It's like, I wish I would have been a little more alert, and this is probably a Tony thing and not necessarily a community, a UX community thing, but I wish I would have thought more about the types of companies I was applying for, what I was doing at that time of life, what I wanted, and then um, you know, go for the things with an objective in mind. I got lucky that everything kind of lined up early on, um, but it, it shouldn't necessarily be put down to luck. All right, and so what we're gonna talk about in this um, I'm going to kind of do a condensed version um, with the late start and just knowing that we want to get to the panel stuff. But the main thing I want to begin to kind of convey is the lay of the land of the different types of companies that are out there. And then the choices that you have as somebody seeking a career in UX, whether it's your first job, your second, or you're later in your career looking to make a change. Hopefully some of what we're going through here will get the wheels spinning and make it a little easier to make calculated decision instead of just applying for that thing. All right, so part one, digital agencies. All right, this is not from a digital agency, uh, but who, give me, raise a hand if you recognize this. All right, I see it, actually, I need more hands. There's a lot of cameras off. All right, Dana, I'm gonna call on you. So what, what is this? It's a shot from Mad Men. Or from Mad Men, the TV show. All right, and, and so if you've seen Mad Men before, even if you, if you haven't, Mad Men was about a, an advertising agency back in the day, like old school, three martini lunches, like you know, big accounts, Coca-Cola, right? And coming up with, with the pitch, with the angle, with the image, with the thing that's gonna connect the brand to consumers and make them use that. And of course, with the advertising came this culture, this really hard boiled, competitive, crazy wild culture Danan, if you were to pick like one word to describe Mad Men, like what's a word that comes to mind? Find um, your new smarmy. I don't Sm know. <laughs> <laughs> really, there's some smarminess going on in agencies. I think that that's fair. Um, who else has seen this show? Uh, it would get, get, give me a word. Sometimes pretentious. A little bit of pretension, attitudes, and egos, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Give me one more. Misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> These are not the words I thought I would get. And that's interesting. Uh, that's more of the era than the, uh, right. than the culture of that's... advertising. I would say things like cut, cutthroat, intense, mm -hmm. um, creative, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe on fire comes to mind. Um, so anyways, some of the things that I think about when I think about working in agency, it requires you to think fast, okay? This is a job where you're gonna be asked to come up with ideas, sometimes right on the spot in front of clients. You're gonna have meetings where either maybe you're trying to land a new account and you've gotta say the right thing or have something to say to that client in the moment. 
Um, maybe in a project or a project meeting, like this thing comes up, hey, we're putting you in this meeting, we got this website we're gonna do, or we've got this client who wants to talk to us about their um, social strategy, right? Sometimes you will be put out of your element. Sometimes you're right there, but it's like they're gonna change things as you go. I flew out to Houston once to meet with a client waste management, and we had prepared a whole thing for them around a content strategy they were interested in. And the minute we walked in the room, they said, you know that thing we asked you for? Forget about that. Um, here's what we need to talk about today. All right, that's agency life, and it can be exciting, but you better be ready for that kind of fast thinking. Now, this one here, David Bowie, ch -ch -ch changes, right? That is definitely a big part of everybody's lives in any job. I think you, you will see it times 100 at an agency. Um, this is changes of people coming and going, your coworkers. It's the clients and the accounts that you work on, uh, whether you're just getting moved or maybe that account moves on and it's a brand new one. Um, but you're going to see that the things you work on, the people, all of that, all the time, um, more so than anything, you experience a lot of change. Now, pre-COVID, this is a, an industry where there'd be a lot of travel. Um, and that can be a benefit or a curse, depending on where you're at in your life. Um, when I mentioned that I had that uh, agency job early on, I was in New York, I was in LA, I was up in, in Seattle. At that time of my life, I was loving it, right? But later on, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, starting a family, kids, got the house. Um, can we please not do this <laughs> for a little bit? I would like to stay put. Um, but that, is, that can be a neat thing. Uh, and we'll see if the industry gets back to that after COVID. Um, anybody got this one? Raise a hand, who knows who, knows who this is? Oh, uh, come on. I'm hoping you asked Dana. <laughs> is Dana, is this a Dana band right here? <laughs> it's, it's music, so it has to be in his wheelhouse, but I think it's Kelly Clarkson. Yeah. There you go. I mean, right. I guess, but not, not my wheelhouse, but. Very good. Nobody will admit to it. Did you take her and, and carry her across the thing? No, I've you're... never carried her on my shoulders. <laughs> So nobody will admit it, but I think that you've probably heard her song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger, right? And that definitely applies uh, for, for, adver or for agency life. Um, you will work extreme hours. Nights and weekends are a regular part of that. Um, you, you will be pushed to do things you haven't done before, to, to try you know, techniques, learn new tools, whatever it's going to be. Um, but you will also find that you know, short of your, maybe your, your college education or what you did in, in school, um, there's not gonna be a greater place for, for learning and doing than these agencies. And last thing I would say that I don't understand exactly why, but there's something about the agency time that if you get in, and th this is kind of a thing too, because this can be both a barrier to coming into an agency that's got some folks that are already implanted and kind of have these bonds and maybe you're the new person, but I found that it's, it's a place where you build really strong relationships with people. Um, kind of again, like college, like there's something about that, that being in this thing together, maybe it's because you're traveling places or because you've got crunch time and you had to order pizza and stay late and eventually have some beers when this is all over or maybe during it. Um, but an agency is, is a place where, um, where you will make some lasting friendships. Now, of course, I'm generalizing. And what we're doing here is essentially kind of a persona, if you will, around a type of industry, a type of thing. Um, you're gonna see elements of this in, in other places, but by creating these dynamics, hopefully I'm giving you a sense of like what an agency is like compared to other things. Um, and that's kind of the goal here. So if we were to say what's typical and nothing is typical, right? But if we were to say what's typical when you're going into an agency, it, it's a smaller team, first of all, because agencies tend to be smaller entities. Um, yeah, there's the big giant ones, but you know, in your office or wherever you're at, you know, you're gonna have, say, four to 10 people. Um, UX will be a standalone department, but you're gonna find that the roles are assigned out based on accounts, right? So you, you know, you've got the waste managed account, you guys are over here on Sonos, Right, And so while you're a team of UX, you're deployed out and you're distributed, but you have that nucleus to, to rely on. Um, designers, strategists, um, developers, you're gonna see those roles, but really agencies, 
like champion unicorns because they need that diverse skill set. If you can do a little bit of all of these things and do some of them really well and be willing to do some of the others, um, it's a good place for you. And you know the types of projects um, all over the place. You will you will get product design, website design, things in the marketing realm, um, apps. You know that's again the variety is actually one of the things that's that's it's interesting and fun about that. A few examples from my past. Um, so redesigning uh, a, a website and event site for ASU. In this case, it was you know, we need to kind of, we need to look back at the audiences of the people that are coming here. We've got some of these groups that are really special to us that we've got to serve. We've got some that are very prickly. If we don't take care of them, it doesn't matter what we do in the redesign, they're going to complain, right? And you start to go through that whole process. And um, by the way, my first week at, back at this agency, um, I, I literally started week number one, um, got to my desk, was told that on day number two, you're going to meet at ASU. And by day number three, I was leading a workshop. And by day number four, um, producing like some of the personas and designing, like it's that fast. And those things will happen there. On the grander scale, that's the thing is that agencies often give you a chance to work with really well-known brands. And if you're looking to build the resume, um, or if you're just tired of, of people not knowing what you do, <laughs> um, you know, the, these, these kind of high profile projects are pretty fun. And that could be e-commerce and branding. It could be apps or it could be campaigns that have landing pages or microsites, those kind of things. Um, and so there's a couple of those things in here. The neat thing that I found about the agencies is it really will extend you. If you are a design discipline, you know, whether that's research, architect, you know, UX or visual, it will extend you into many channels of what design means. You will get exposure to content and social and um, search and other aspects here that you may not get in other places. Um, again, it's that stretch factor. So the pros of working at an agency, variety of projects, lots of different things going on. We'll see with, with COVID if it comes back, but travel can be a perk. You will generally see younger people um, who have you know, ability to be more free perhaps in their time. And one thing I, I want to note too, is that um, in terms of knowing like how you're doing, like measures of success, like is my design work having an impact? You will always have measures in an agency. You will never wonder where you stand. Um, things like every project comes with metrics that you have to hit. And because these clients hire you or fire you, um, you get a pretty good idea of where you stand uh, and they let you know. And sometimes that's, that can be a very good thing. Um, on, the, on the other side, things to consider maybe that could be cons of, it, of an agency, that high turnover. Um, I, you know, people, people coming in and coming out, it's not for everybody, but also a lot of people use the agency as a stepping stone to another part of their career. And it does create a lot of opportunities. When you work with these companies, Sometimes they say, hey, we really like you. Come here, let's, let's talk. Would you like to come in-house over to our company and just work for us? Um, the, the, the sad part that people don't talk about, but there's a reality is that agencies don't have often very big bank accounts. Um, you, lose a, you lose a multi-million dollar client, people lose their jobs. Um, you land a big client, you hire more people and build a team. You know, it can be feast or famine sometimes. Um, agencies work really hard to get to a stability because they never want that to happen. We know it, you care about these people, as we said. And so, you know, the goal is not to have it happen, but that is a risk of, of agencies, depending on what happens with trends in business and trends in the economy. Clients can be seen maybe as a con. Uh, they can dictate. Uh, they can be rude and rough. Um, they can be demanding, uh, but you will, you will also have clients that you love. And the culture of sink or swim, um, again, generalizing, but typically if you're signing on to an agency, what you're signing on for is that you are ready to be handed work and that you with, with little direction will start cranking. There's people you can ask, there's things you can do, but they're trusting that you're coming in with the tool set that you're going to start going, right? Um, and, if, and if you don't, um, and things around this culture or this approach are a bad fit, those people don't usually last long. So agency atmosphere, um, usually pretty hip. 
Um, they're, they're kind of the first ones that pioneered really cool workspaces. And now you see them a lot more in every, you know, all over the place. But it used to be if you wanted the really neat building and the new, really neat rooms with the speakeasy in the back, like that was an agency. Um, also within the hip factor, um, you know, this has also changed over time, but agencies were the first place where your tattoos and your long hair didn't matter. Um, it was all about the people and the work and what you brought um, and, the, and the caliber of the deliverables. And it gave you more freedom to just be who you are. Um, now, I think that that's just where culture has moved. But there are definitely pockets that we'll talk about that are still more corporate, uh, depending on industry or size of the company and culture of the company. And scrappy. Um, so I think you also will see that sometimes agencies are just like, we just set this up and it looks a lot like, you know, we just got here maybe last over the weekend and packed up. Um, agencies are there to grow and do great work. Um, and, uh, and yeah, sometimes the environment can be a little sloppy because of it. Okay, I'll pause there. Um, and actually, I'm going to stop sharing for one second before we go to the next one. So looking at the group, I have it on gallery view. Hopefully all you do as well, switch to gallery. So let's do this. Um, if you have worked for an agency before, leave your camera on or turn it on if it's off. If you have never worked in an agency, turn your camera off. Let's just take a look. Come through and ooh, ooh, let's see. Uh, Wait a minute, like cameras keep going off. Uh, one, two, three, four. Am I counting that right? So four people have are admitting to agency experience? Okay, everybody come back on if you like. That's interesting. Um, so agency, people who had your cameras on, um, what resonated in that? What would you say is kind of true? I don't need to hear everything, but like one thing, and what would you say maybe I was uh, a little off on on your experience? and come off mute and let's hear it. I'll jump in. Um, All right. Yeah, in my experience, I would, I would say most of it was very true, um, but I got fortunate and I worked for a very small boutique agency that kind of had like a family culture. Um, and so the, the long hours, evenings and weekends, we didn't do, which was really nice. <laughs> that's rare in my experience, <laughs> yeah, but that's I, great. I felt very lucky. <laughs> I think if anybody, has anybody worked at um, tell or um, Tara Lever, I, I would only assume that they're probably work. They worked long hours and, and hard nights. I don't know if uh, Travis or anybody is on, but I have. When I worked at a uh, JWG Advertising in Boston, um, they had. I was in a kind of a different area though. I was doing like CD-ROM development and CD-ROM design, so it was. It wasn't as like fast paced, but you know, there was still this idea of getting it done. You have to get it done. And we have Home Depot waiting for it. <laughs> and then it's like, um, there was a lot of uh, pressure in it, especially being kind of young doing it at the time. There you go. How about one more, one more person with the agency experience? Um, what rang true? What's something maybe a little different? Matt? Oh, when I first got the job, the second day I was in, I was the first day was, here's all your computers. The second day was, you've got three meetings, two clients, just go for it. Just pretend you know what you're doing. It's just like, off you go. So, but it's good. It's good. So it's good to know that what you're getting into. And I will tell you, um, I've been a friend of ASU for a while, and Susan, if you guys know Susan Squire, by the way, she just announced she's retiring. She was the chair at the, at, at the Git, yeah, at, at the Graphic in, in, Information Technologies. I have the name all wrong, at the Git. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, she was telling me about a student who was a really good designer, somebody that she thought was a superstar, but she was looking kind of at, at two very different companies, it, it, kind of this fork in the road thing. And one was a bigger kind of company like a GoDaddy and the other was an agency thing. And she was asking for some, some input. And the thing is, I feel like early on, like Matt, like what you're just talking about, like, my gosh, don't you just want all the experience, all the challenge you can get. Like if you're feeling up for it and that fit's gonna fit your personality, it's no better place at the beginning of your career because you will build your chops. 
you will build your resume, you'll get opportunities beyond your years of experience. But again, you know, trying to know yourself, like if, you know, and, and I have a, actually a slide later on coming up on that, but if, if you know things about yourself where you're like, but I kind of like, I prefer to be paired up with somebody senior. I want someone to kind of show me the ropes a little bit, or, um, you know, I, I, I'm not both an IT and a project manager and a developer and a designer all in one. I'm really just good at this thing that I want to focus on. Then you can maybe decide that that's not for you. Um, which is the point of the talk to be able to hopefully make a little bit better decisions. Um, so let's go to the next one here. Um, so in-house design is what we refer this to, or just in-house. Okay, who knows this one? By the way, at the ASU, when I gave this talk, there's some of you ASU people on this call, they didn't know this. They didn't recognize this just by the look. Freaked me out. I'm like, what? This is not that old. You are showing the other swap display if you wanted. I don't Am know. I? Okay, no. let me stop share and I'll go over I'm here and that. desktop two. All right, how's that? Full screen? I don't want to read ahead. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. In a tech. This is in, in a tech. Okay, so Matt, give me one word uh, to kind of describe these, this, this situation here. This scene? Office space in general. Oh, like, what's an office space show. Um, Inefficient. Inefficient. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. Who else has seen office space and can give me a word? Bureaucracy. Why to say it again? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. Okay. Good one. Let's get one more. Downsizing. Downsizing. Oh boy. Yep. Okay. So if you haven't Drudgery. seen this <laughs> Drudgery. If you haven't seen this awesome comedy film about life in the 90s, I would say 2000s era, if I'm, if I'm right, you can tell by looking at the computer screen there, it's, it's a while back, but what it's like to work in-house at a company. This is maybe a caricature and a kind of the worst case study of what it is. Um, but when we say in-house, um, we're talking about a couple of different things. Um, oops, let me go back here. Established businesses. So what we mean by in-house is that this is a company that's up and running it has, um, it, has, it has a purpose, right? We do CRM software or we serve, we, we, have, we have a special uh, real estate package uh, specifically for realtors to be able to run websites and market their properties. It's usually more of a singular focus. What you'll find is there is revenue. So they have a building, they've got a workforce, they've got insurance and things, um, you know, but the, um, because they're established business, they have a real culture. Now, agencies, of course, have culture too, but the transient nature, the, 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 the fast pace, it, it, it's a different type of magnitude when you talk about the culture of one of these companies. You're really deciding about kind of a relationship and you can expect that it will not necessarily be changing all the time like at the agency. Now, some in-house can be around startups and you used to see that a lot more, I think, than you do these days. Um, you know, come join my company, right? We've got funding, we've got this idea, we're gonna be big. Um, a lot of them, I loved all the comments here from the folks with the office space, but um, a lot of what you see now is more about choosing from existing companies. And so with this, I don't, I mean this for what, it, for what it's worth, for what I think it actually is, that there is some degree of drinking the Kool-Aid when you join these companies, because they're often small enough, say 100 employees, 500 employees or the 500 would be really big, you know, like 250. It's a small enough big company that you're going to get in there and they've got their culture of what they do. You've got their leadership and their bosses. They've got the people and they kind of have the way that things go and they know who they are and you're joining them, right? You're not necessarily there to shape it or change it. You're coming on board to that cruise ship and you're going sailing with them. As a result, one of the interesting things about going in-house is Process is everywhere. I mean, you're going to see it in the agency and, and you're going to see it, you know, be kind of lightweight and agile and fast. You're going to see it at big companies that are enterprises that need to coordinate across, you know, many global locations. But, you know, for a crash course in, in process, these companies are office, often very process heavy. They have a delivery mechanism. They work hard to establish how this company gets the things done. And you kind of come on board to that. And yeah, it evolves 
but um, you will learn a lot about process and you'll probably have a role in that process and you'll start speaking the language of the process when you go in-house and you'll know where design is in that process for better or for worse. Um, hallmarks of in-house, it, it does have, again, not to say this isn't everywhere, but you will see that family vibe that the, you know, the team, having a softball team or a soccer team or flag football or a group that goes out and, you know, does whatever it is that they do. Like there's a lot of outings and, and things that you can participate in. It's, it's a little bit of a joiner thing. Um, a thing to look out for. And again, I think this has mostly gone away, but I know being here a long time in the Valley early on, when you went in-house, the danger is you're the designer as in singular. And we've got our engineering teams and our project management, and you're going to do the UX. That can be awesome. A lot of times you hear that you're going to have the opportunity to maybe build a team and you know grow what you do, and you're going to be the first person. But that can also be a little bit of a curse um, with the pressure and, and trying to change an organization and all the things that go with that. So something to look out for. So what's typical in-house for what we're talking about here? Um, one to 10 UXers. Now, again, I think this is changing because when I write this from my perspective as somebody whose career has been, you know, over the, the two, 90s, 2000s, 2010s into present, um, UX has really grown as a career. And I think more companies know they need it and don't try to get it done with just one person, but it's out there. But you will be part of a standalone department. Um, you will have a combination of disciplines that fulfill what that company needs. So it's similar to the agency in that way, but these teams are all focused on the mission. Um, it's project teams because the business focus is more singular. So it's not a lot of different accounts and things. It's like our CRM software, our real estate solution. And then we're gonna build the app for that or this new feature that lets people do X, Y, Z. Um, so when you see these examples from some of the past, um, they look very businessy, right? Because often these companies where you're going in-house do business like B2B type things, um, sometimes B2C, but more likely like the, the famous example locally is WebPT, like doing things, software for physical therapists, right? It's that kind of thing. So you'll see a lot of dashboards, a lot of, um, you know, list views, um, lookups, you know, things like that, that you're going to be building. God forbid any wizards. Okay, the nice part um, to kind of generalize, you will be able to mostly rely on a 40 hour work week. There might be a few long ones during the year where it's crunch time for whatever reason or something happened, but you will be have a more reliable, a more sane schedule than an agency. Um, the whole idea of like work from home Fridays or whatever, like that the first place I encountered that was, was at going in house. And, you know, I think it started with blue jeans and Hawaiian shirts, <laughs> and then it turned to, can we just do this from home? Um, let's travel. Um, so you may go to conferences. You may have like an annual customer conference or an industry thing that you go to. Um, you may go to, maybe there are a couple locations for this company, although often it's, it's one big box. Um, but let's travel in general. Um, process, which is actually a good thing to be able to learn and master. You'll need that throughout your career and mentoring. Because people have been there longer, um, you're going to run into the senior and the principal and other folks who can kind of show you how we do these things here and talk to you a bit about, um, you know, adapting and, and, and getting on track with that company. On the con side, so, you know, maybe you're not happy just working on CRM software. It's like, you know, we've been working for these sales guys a long time, contact management after five years, is maybe too much. Um, so maybe you want variety. Um, variety comes in some different ways. You can definitely get creative, especially as a designer on these jobs, but the subject matter may not, will definitely not be as varied as what you would see at an agency. Bosses, it seems like at an agency, yeah, the bosses are out there and they're, they're big personalities and they're people you're gonna work with, but you can be you and you're expected to kind of set up shop and, and kick butt. In, in the culture of an in-house, there is a higher established hierarchy. Um, you know, that boss that's been there has probably been there for a while. Um, and they're gonna, they're gonna tell you uh, a bit about um, how things run there. You will have a little bit older. And I think again, because you're gonna see people with, with, with families, people that actually like that stability and less travel and this kind of supports where they're at at life. Um, 
that can be maybe good or bad. Um, the one man wolf pack we talked about, look out for it. And then the benefits will be there, but smaller companies have more expensive benefits. If you are in your 20s and it's just you, you're golden. Um, you know, wherever you go, you're going to pay a very low copay. You don't have to worry. You're healthy and young, hopefully, anyways. But as you start to get into your late 20s and 30s, you're having kids and families, um, God forbid, other health issues start to come into play for you. Those benefits can matter. And all of a sudden, you're, you're going to find the expenses are, are pretty big um, at, at one of these companies, although they are there, which is great. So examples locally, um, formerly Infusionsoft, now Keep, right? You can kind of see that that culture. It looks like a fun place to be. Uh, they get they uh, they get a cool building too. Um, Swift Page. This is where Alan and I first met when they were Act and Sales Logics, then Sage Software. This company still continues. And when I talk about Kool Aid, I don't mean it bad, but don't you get a little bit of that sense? Like if you were the new person. Yeah, you better put your blue on and hang out and you're going to join a family. That's kind of what it is. Um, and Carvana, which has actually grown so much at this point, it's hard to call them uh, just an in-house kind of thing, but they are focused on, you know, singular entity. Uh, it's just, it just keeps scaling from what it was into what it is today. Okay, so let's, let's do the same thing. I am going to stop and let's go to gallery view. And... Um, Let's do this. Um, if you've worked in-house somewhere as a designer, as I've kind of described it, best of my ability, have your camera on. If you've not had that experience, let's go off. Okay, and see, so this is good. Um, we're gonna, we have one more of these to go. Now, I think what we're seeing here is we've got our job seekers and our folks that are out there. And hopefully this is, this is resonating to you and you're getting a sense of some of the choices. Um, and, and then we'll see if maybe in this third category is where the other people are. Um, but for those that have worked in-house design, same question. And Annie, let's go to you because I don't think we've heard from you yet, if you don't mind. What, yeah. what rang true? What would you say is a little different from that description in your experience? Um, well, I worked at a home furnishing company and, um, again, the dynamic was very, it was very fluid, but we had to take care of a lot of other departments like sales, marketing, and it wasn't just like, um, like we had a lot of other departments involved and we couldn't, um, we had a lot of voices that we had to take care of. So, um, yeah, making decisions wasn't easy. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the decisions thing I, that resonates with me. Michael, your camera's on. What was your experience kind of in-house? You're not talking American Express because I have a new category for them. Uh, yeah, so uh, previous lifetime ago, uh, we had consolidated all of our design into one in-house kind of agency. And uh, what I liked about that was just the ability to kind of have that family atmosphere that wasn't about your projects. It was just the greater UX uh, community. We had designers, we had ethnographers, we had taxonomists, we had uh, content writers. Um, uh, it was it was a good medium for me because it got me away from that co co corporate culture a little because we felt uh, nimble enough. Again, multiple voices because we were supporting many different parts of the business. Um, so yeah, it was a good happy medium. That's a good call out. You know, GoDaddy has an in-house agency. And that's something that I didn't talk about in this because I'm trying to make really distinct blocks, right? But that is a neat thing, like, you know, an oasis almost, you know, perhaps within the corporate culture, if you're in a big company, could be that concept. They do that because they want the benefits of that agency mindset. They're trying to promote the creativity and the ingenuity a lot of times. And it is acting then as a service to the business. Um, that, that's a great, great one to hear about, Michael. Thanks. Let's get one more. Um, Rebecca, your experience working in-house, was that yeah. kind of ringing true or what was different for you? Yeah, well, and my in-house is not at a company, but it's at University of Arizona in the library, but we're similar to what you described as we're like 200, 300 staff within the organization. Our UX team is two full-time people and then some students and interns. So we're pretty small 
we're stretched pretty thin. There is a lot of process. I think the thing about making decisions resonates that it's it's harder. There's bosses, there's stakeholders, there's a lot of desire to have everyone on board with changes before you make them. Um, and you do feel kind of perhaps under staffed and that you you're asked to do a lot with a little. Um, but you're also because you're in, you know, you're within the culture of the organization and you have those business goals and you kind of understand where you're going. Um, it does kind of help because you can sort of help shift the culture over time and kind of be part of that broader picture of what the mission of the, for us, what the mission of the, the library is within the university setting. So for us, it, yeah, I think it was, it was surprisingly similar to what I've experienced, even though it's, you were speaking more at the corporate level. Yes. Well, and you just used a, a key word there, mission. There's, there's often a mission to get on board to. And that can be a really good thing um, if, you know, but you got to analyze that and say, is this for me? Is this, is this going to be something I can sink my teeth into and spend some time on and want to devote myself to? Um, I had a great experience uh, with my in-house uh, opportunities. And I spent uh, like five and a half years at, at the one of them and wouldn't trade it. Um, but I, you know, I didn't, it, as I said, in, in my career at that time, I didn't, consciously make a decision to go there. I just landed there and it ended up being good. So hopefully we've given folks something to think about and making the decision on the in-house. So one more of these um, to talk about here. Let's go over to desktop again and we'll continue. Okay, so enterprise, big companies. Um, big companies by this, I you know we'll see examples, but of course, GoDaddy, um, Facebook, Google, um, could be IBM or um, American Airlines, that kind of thing, large enterprise companies. Um, we all, distributed for, workforce is a reality of, of every company. And now we're all doing it because of COVID. Like that's, this is just how things are. Um, but something actually that is, you know, when we went from GoDaddy, for example, when, when COVID came, there was no adjustment. Like this is what my meetings always look like. Um, and a lot of them I would take from my desk because throughout the day I'm working with teams where the people that are on this team are not in this office anyways. And then I go to lunch and I talk to people and do things or whatever, and then I'm back to my desk. And I may end up in a conference room at some point in a meeting, but even if I do, it's a Zoom room and there's four people at, at the table and eight of them on the screen, right? Um, so distributed workforce, again, I think it's, it's kind of just reality of, of life now. But that's the hallmark of enterprise because they're big, they're spread out, there's lots of different offices and your team won't be necessarily in the same building. Now think about that for a minute uh, because in-house, better chance, better chance, not guaranteed. I mean, in-house can still have multiple locations or, or people that work remotely, but if it's important to you to be around the people that you work with, that my team I go out to lunch with them, or I, you know, we, we do things, we play that softball on the weekend, or I can just, I can just go have, if I have a question, talk to a person and not to the digital facsimile, then you're going to see a little bit more of that happening in, in the um, in-house. Now, agency, as we said, that's a little bit unique because you've got your, your account team, and those are going to be typically people that you're going to be physically working with. And then you've got your UX team, kind of your, your community of practice folks. So you've got that home base too. And so I think what's different here is, is that you will, you will have your network at a large enterprise, but that network, no matter what, you may, you may go you know, a whole year without necessarily seeing that person face-to-face. -face. It may not matter, maybe the preferred, I don't know, but that's what it is. Um, the big companies pay the big bucks, and this is true. Um, when it comes to salary, those are kind of normalizing. They, like, you won't see that much bigger of a salary, maybe in some cases, but you, you'll get competitive salaries. But where it really makes a difference is what they call total compensation, which is a big thing that they love to talk about in HR today. Companies want to keep salaries relatively low for business reasons, but overall compensation is your bonus. It is your stock options. It is your benefits. And when you layer those things on, you know, let's say that you're making 100,000 a year, uh, but then you get a 20% bonus and you've got you know, 30,000 a year in stocks that are maturing, all of a sudden that, that stuff adds up. And then something that I found to be really true, like as a person with a small family working at an agency, my monthly bill of insurance was around $900. 
And now that I'm GoDaddy, at GoDaddy, it's, it's, it's less than half of that. And so you keep more of your money. And uh, okay, people are talking about time off as a benefit too. Um, it's hard to take time, like, you know, the agency I worked at had unlimited time off. When the hell are you supposed to take it? There's nobody else that can do the job that I'm doing, you know, and, and, and you it never tricks. stops, <laughs> right? And so, but at, at, the, at the bigger company, uh, you probably do have uh, a greater resource pool and a greater opportunity to actually use that benefit. So something to think about. Um, perks, like food trucks. At any GoDaddy office, um, here in the Valley at least, if you got to Gilbert, Tempe, uh, Scottsdale, at lunchtime, you have a choice of like two or three or three or four different food trucks, trucks to choose from. And they're, they used to be free and now they're discounted, you know, things change, but um, it's awesome. And there's lots of different little things like that. Like when you open the fridge or whatever else, um, you know, uh, neat things that are out there. Now, some may look at big companies and think about some of the negative connotations, Facebook and elections, <laughs> right? Um, there's actually very positive things. Big companies, for the most part, uh, from what I've seen, also have a very altruistic side to them. If you want to get involved in a cause, you can do that. If you want to see a company that gives back, you can be part of those things. Um, I was able to volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club um, as a coach. It was for my daughter's team. And GoDaddy not only gave me the time and encouraged me to do that, but they took all of the hours that I, that I put into that and they paid the Boys and Girls Club out for those, for those volunteer hours and money that went into their local community bank to just do what they do to you know, add more computers or classes or whatever the things are that the sports that they could do for kids. Um, it's neat to, have, to be at a place because I think every company tries to do this, but the ability for the enterprise to do it is, is much greater. Um, <laughs> on the uh, flip side, when there's so many teams, like, yeah, you come in and you're, you know, at GoDaddy, there's over a hundred designers, right? You can just be awesome. It can still be hard to stand out in the crowd um, and, and make your mark. And sometimes it might feel like I'm killing it over here. Is anybody noticing? Um, some people are, but are you getting ahead? Getting, you know, one of the complaints in a big company is that do they promote enough from, from inside or are they always kind of bringing in the next big shot from outside the company? But no matter what you do, like we get the benefit of in the big companies of having like employee surveys and voice uh, things. You hear a lot about, you know where each other stands. And a lot of times people are maybe not so happy with upper management or with parts of the experience like career pathing, but they always seem to say, but I love my team, my team is great. And um, so I think, you know, the caliber of people that you meet, like you go, wow, these are really smart and talented people. Um, the, the social parts of it, you know, the opportunity. I'm part of the GoDaddy Fit Club. We, go on, we used to go on hikes around the mountains out here and, and have great time talking and doing stuff. Um, there's all kinds of things like that, I think, that promote this culture that where, while there's big company problems, you will also find that you have um, a good bond and a good core, especially with your team. So what's typical? Um, on the smaller side, you still will see teams, you know, big companies that are smaller. But, you know, as I mentioned, fleets of UXers, hundreds of, of UX people spread out across different things is not uncommon in these big enterprises, especially in the tech industries. Um, what's interesting is you will see that UX is not necessarily a standalone department. And I'm not saying that's a right or wrong way to do it, but we will have UX people that work over in the marketing group. Right. And so these folks are looking at GoDaddy.com and people shopping, or they're looking at our emails that we send out for email marketing um, or search engine marketing with landing pages that bring people into our experience. And they're designing out there. And meanwhile, there's this whole other team. They do our website builder. Right. So the templated system that people like get in and build their websites, somebody has to design that tool. And, uh, and they've been designing the heck out of it. We used to have a new to market tool that was trying hard to catch up to Wix and Squarespace and a dedicated team has moved that over the years to where now it's really become good. And that was their sole focus. So it's something to think about. Like when you go to a big company as UX, you have decisions to make. Am I interested in designing more for the marketing and, and kind of the social and, and things over here? Am I more interested in brand and creative in that way? Um, do I want to work on products and engineering? 
Um, and one thing that you'll see at big companies too is they do have typically the resources to have a dedicated research team. So you can be a researcher full time and have a team of researchers at companies that are large. All right. Um, so a few examples, like big companies love visioning. North stars are a big thing. You might do some pretty cool projects where you're looking at the future state, strategic kind of direction of the company and, and developing visionary things. That's kind of cool. Um, product experiences. Sometimes you're going right down into like sticky points, things that can make a big difference. If somebody's going to look at GoDaddy's website builder next to Wix, Squarespace, or Shopify, and we actually, because that's a tough sell. Like, are you going to try GoDaddy? Because we're maybe not the one that's known for this thing. Um, you go, you know, you go in. If in the first onboarding screen we screw up and we lose you before you're even in the tool and we don't get the right ex get the experience right, then we blew it. So these can be really important parts of the user experience and the customer experience overall that you'll get to go to work on and optimize. Um, another example, like this is just a shopping cart and it's, and it's how the basket appears. As designers, we know though that just a shopping cart, there's no such thing. This is a huge part of the experience and getting this right can make the difference from a person who feels like they're in control and being treated fairly and are moving intuitively through a process to somebody that doesn't know what just happened or feels like this, this website's trying to pull a fast one on me and maybe loses trust and abandons. And the other thing that's neat is, you, you know, working on lots of different things, as I mentioned, is you may find that the thing that you're doing is, is not design at all. You're leading a workshop that's customer focused and using tools like empathy maps to help the uh, marketing team with their messaging. Uh, so you get to use your tools in different ways. Pros and cons of big enterprise, again, more stability here um, on the work week. Uh, hours are typically your 40 hour work week. Um, work from anywhere. That's kind of been true before COVID and now it's like definitely the law of the land. Um, you know, right when, like within months of when COVID hit, the guy that had the desk right behind me at GoDaddy, he moved up to Prescott. He's like, I'm out of here, dude. That's, that's where his heart's at. He's a big climber and outdoors guy. And he's like, you know, he got a place up there and he hasn't come back. And that's where he's going to live now. Um, and it's, it's kind of a cool thing, the freedom. And I think you're going to see more of that as a trend in general. Pay and benefits, we talked about employee groups and causes. Um, and you will have lots of opportunities for training and mentoring in the big company. Uh, cons, it, like the in-house, it will be more of a singular focus you may run into corporate culture. That could be a good or a bad thing. And a lot of times it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, these, can, these can be um, office politics. It can be egos. It can be backstabbing or things like that. Um, it's just what you think. Um, not, not everywhere. I think companies work really hard to try to have a great culture and they understand the importance of it. But at big companies, that can be hard sometimes. Reorgs are reality. Um, I, I can't, you know, you hire into one team, one department, one mission. Six months later, all of a sudden your boss is over here. You're moved over there. You're working on a new group. And then another eight months later, they do it again. Big companies seem to love reorgs, always trying to get more efficient. Um, layoffs can occur. Um, won't get too much into that one. Just, you know, big companies, cost savings. It's mostly when things like acquisitions or things uh, occur, but sometimes industry or technology based. And then just that thing, the same way I said that in an agency, you'll always know the score, how your work is, is delivering to a metric. Like, did we win? Did we lose? Are we in good standing with the client? Are we getting more business? Did this website succeed? You will know. But at a big company, like when you make that change, okay, I, I improve the onboarding part of the website builder. Like in the grand scheme of GoDaddy, I can show this little number went up, but like as, as, as the great designer that I am and with the ambitions that I have, does improving an onboarding flow equal the kind of impact I wanna have? Um, am I gonna get the recognition and the ability to grow what I wanna do in the way I wanna do? Probably, but sometimes you may find yourself wondering. Big companies have adopted the agency look and feel like they want to attract top talent. So they've started to kind of emulate and now they all have, for the most part, pretty cool buildings. Um, so these are some of the, the, the different screenshots of some of them, even in healthcare, like the campuses are getting more interesting. 
uh, Honeywell, well, you know, you got to keep, keep working at it. Um, but there we go. So let me actually pause there. I will stop sharing. Oops, not that one. There we go. Large enterprise, folks, let's do the cameras on if you've worked at a big, big company. All right, Cody, you were the first one that showed up with the, uh, <laughs> the big arms there. Um, tell us about your experience. What resonates in that? What was maybe a little different? You're on mute. Mute. Mute, mute, mute. There you go. Thanks. I was a human factors engineer there, so I wasn't in the UX group, um, but I did do vi visual design with them. And uh, it's, it's good. You're talking about Honeywell, right? What's that? You're talking about Honeywell? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, we I, thought, that part. I thought that was the last uh, picture you had up. So. It was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Honeywell. Sorry. Um, it's good in the sense that if the company is committed to a project, they will pour tons and tons of money into it. Um, it also means that if you are of a unique skill set, you're probably going to be the only one doing it or one of a very small handful of people doing it. And um, they have a tendency to over rely on those specialties. Um, but you also get to work on some really cool stuff. Um, some really interesting technologies. I worked on flight decks, so business jets. And so we did cockpit software and it was, it was very, very fun because um, you get to work on very complex projects with very complex problems and very cool people, smart people with uh, lots of industry experience. So um, like you said, there's, there's pros and cons um, um, to all of them, but it just depends on what you like, I guess. Awesome. Thanks, Cody. Kristen, we haven't heard from you. It looks like you've had a few experiences. Tell us about uh, the, the large company experience. Yeah, so I'm currently at American Express, and previously I came from a place where I was the only designer. Uh, so hard to stand out. I'm one of 20 now, and I feel like no one knows exactly what I've worked on. And before, everyone knew I designed everything. But I mean, the pros are I have collaboration now, and I have a lot of help, which I didn't before. I felt like I was supporting three dev teams, and now I only support one. Wow. It's like we wrote the slides together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Shannon, tell us about what you think about GoDaddy. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about we were already distributed, which we have been for a while. And like you said, we all had Zoom calls all day long before pandemic. Um, one thing that's also changed for us over the years is that we've really become global. And so not only were all of our Zoom calls, we had Zoom calls all day, but then we started having them at all sorts of interesting hours. We acquired um, uh, design team in South Africa and all of a sudden that was a tricky call to schedule with all of you know the designers all over the U.S. and then all over the world so um, that makes it a little trickier but it's also really interesting to get to work with people from all over the world and um, all of those different uh, opinions and and different um, life experiences bring coming together and and uh, makes it a very interesting design team so when I started at GoDaddy we were all co-located in the Scottsdale office, all of the UX designers. And so since then to being fully global has been a really, really exciting um, journey to have gone on with GoDaddy. Yeah, it, it really, I think it really transformed. In a way, GoDaddy was almost like an in-house type feel that grew yeah. into this massive enterprise. And you've been there for a lot of that. Yeah. Um, Michael, anything to add? Just, you know, thinking purely on the American Express side, like what do you, what do you, what do you got? So the only thing I would add, um, and you hear this term every once in a while from people or this description that at a big corporation, your experience is really gonna be driven by your manager. So I think the only thing that I would add to what Tony said is in a, in a large, large corporation, they're gonna have a culture within that company, but you're gonna have these mini cultures within um, departments or, or these uh, pods, or you know, I've, I've heard them named all kinds of things. But um, the, the fact that you could have very different cultures laterally uh, between peers that are doing the exact same activity, um, you could have drastically different experiences under the same roof. But that's also a pro because you can shift within the domain of the, of the corporation to a space that might suit you a little better. 
It's great. I think okay. another, another thing to add to, well, well, I don't know if you're going to get into it, you may not, but, you know, with Nudesic as being a consultancy, they have the ability to have these experiences that emulate large corporations because you may be involved in a large corporation or in, in, in all honesty, Nudesic isn't small and we have 16 offices around the world. So it's kind of, and it has, but it has like a small feel when you're in your region or when you're in our Phoenix market, but then we have the national feel, which is obviously different than the, the regional feel or the market feel. And you, and we have a advertising kind of mentality in some places and, you know, and we're fast. We have to show results for big corporate corporations that obviously have different ways of doing things. Uh, we're often coming in and, and changing the way they do it. You'd be surprised how many big enterprise places are not equipped to handle user experience problems, uh, at least the ones that we get involved with. And maybe, maybe that's why they hire us because <laughs> they can't do it. But it is funny, like with consultancies, you'll have a, you'll have all of those things up and down and you'll have to pivot from contract to contract or sal to sal. Yeah, I think I remember you talking about that in a, in a previous meetup. And I, I do think a consultancy is like a different animal. Totally different. Yeah. From each of these that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Alan, you know, your camera should have been on. Are you drinking wine over there? Or what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? You should have been talking in a few of these. You're hiding from me. Um, I, I had to refill and now I'm empty. <laughs> you see? All right. This, uh, that means we're I'm just... okay. I'm actually having internet in issues and uh, I was on tech support with Cox yelling at them. Uh, okay. That's what's going on. Well, we're about to segue into the panel. So I wanted to make sure that uh, he was there. I got one last thing I wanted to show you here. Um, this... Um, this deck actually goes on. It was for a longer talk with ASU. Um, so there's sections in here about getting noticed, the kind of things to get seen, about doing the interviews. I'll share the slides out so you can dig into those. But to conclude for tonight, um, just thinking about those different things, it's really about getting you all who are looking at, you know, starting a UX careers or, or making a change, um, you know, moving to a different, you know, different job. Um, to think about some of these things um, as you head into it. So now we've got the lay of the land, but looking at yourself, um, are you at this point in life, are you kind of in that self-starter mode? I've got the skills, I got the tools, just give me the good work and let me go. Um, or are you at a place where maybe, you know, you're looking for more training or guidance? That's one of the things to think about uh, because they offered, you know, as you heard agency, great for self-starters, maybe not as good at the training, Whereas an enterprise or in-house, you're gonna get some of that guidance. So whether you're a career changer or just starting out, if that's your personality, that could be good for you. Um, again, depending on time of life and just the kind of person you are, are you all in? Are you ready to put in you know, 60, 70 hours, travel, go where you need to go, do anything that needs to be said? That can be a lot of fun. And you can have amazing experiences and it can be exhausting, but worth it. Um, but if you need work-life balance, if, if, if you're that kind of person, hey, I'm, you know, I work for a living and then I love the outdoors. I, I mountain bike. It's important to me. Or I've got a family, right? Or whatever the thing's going to be, you know, considering those will help you. Are you a people person? You know, I love to talk. You guys, anybody who knows me, I've been doing these talks and meetups and companies. Like, I can get out there. Um, that makes me a good candidate for agencies because you're always meeting new people and you kind of need to be that conversation starter type. But if, you know, there was definitely a time in my career when I was more of a, of a UX engineer, like I really loved the time in the cube, just coding, just building websites and, and, and coding and like put my headphones on and go. Um, so thinking about that, that's another thing. Um, on down the line, you get the idea. As I've been saying this, you've kind of looked at the rest. Take time to think about where you're at, what you want to get. Think about some of the opportunities based on the type of company and then go for it. Make that play for the thing that you want and good luck.
All right, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Matt. And we basically, we have a group of folks, myself included, who are hiring managers for different types of companies and different types of UX roles. We wanna open it up and field questions from everybody here. Um, Matt, you wanna kinda take it over and moderate for us? Sure, um, let me, um, well, I guess we'll uh, do some hand raising, I guess. Um, let me uh, I'm trying to find the view, okay, gallery view. Um, so anybody have any general questions about, I had a couple of actually questions that people asked in the uh, chat Maybe we can start there. Um, there is one that uh, from Jennifer Smith. Uh, can you at some point tonight tell us a, a lot about um, start uh, a lot about starting a in a few years in salaries for UX? So basically, what is it? What are our expectations around salaries around UX? Uh, and minimum experience qualifications required for are required for UX job in the US. Really good question. Who wants to start? Michael Amex, um, tell us a bit about that. Are you hiring full-time contractors? What could they expect as far as if you want to get your foot in the door, like where you start? So, so I'll answer on behalf of two companies because I've, I've just recently left Amex. I'm back at Intel. Um, so I should have updated you on that, Tony, but thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, but I can answer for both because I, I was, I was, uh, recently hiring for Amex and we're recent and we're uh, hiring it at Intel. So, uh, the question is around salaries and expectations. Is that? Yeah, yes. Okay. So, uh, mainly, mainly what are, I, I think with the gist of it is what, what are typical salaries for UX? What's your minimum experience qualifications for a UX job? So I'll, I'll, I'll broad stroke the, the salary question, at least at the beginning to say, there are two ways to get into corporations, right? You could absolutely go, I want a full-time gig, um, which you start to get into what Tony was talking about with total compensation, where they're gonna say you have a base, you have a bonus, you have uh, a, a revenue sharing, you stock, whatever all that package is. Uh, and then you have the consultant routes. So we're always going to pay more for consultants uh, as a base, but you don't get a lot of those other perks. Um, you're actually working for a different entity. Um, so we we balance both of those at Amex. We went very heavy on on contractors. Um, I, I think disproportionately so. Um, I, I think at, at one point there were twenty odd. Uh, UX people in the in the Desert uh, Ridge office and and easily two thirds were contractors, uh, and and the contractors that I worked with um, love that kind of life, right? You you work on either six or twelve month contracts, you can make a lot of money. I would say uh, somebody with with lower experience, um, uh, fresh out of college, recent got graduate, we were hiring at around seventy five k. Uh, and then, you know, you could probably go up from there to 150k ish at American Express, uh, depending on your years and and all that fun stuff. Um, with with full time, just tailor those numbers down a tad. Uh, not the 75. I think that's that was a that was a full time role that I was thinking about there. But but tailored down maybe 10 percent. But no, there's a bigger upside if the company is doing well. So at American Express, as Tony said, you might have some bonus program that says you're going to get 12 or 15 percent. Some companies are up to 20 percent. Uh, they contribute to your 401k of of, of anywhere between four and six percent, depending on which corporation you're at. Uh, they're going to do some type of profit sharing into your 401k as another contribution. You could probably tack on a good eight to 10k on top of that. So the numbers can get up there. Um, if you, if you don't use base as the comparison. Yeah. I think you also have a market scenario there too, because yes. you'll have a, um, you know, you have hot markets, you have markets that are in need, you'll have markets with a lot of competition. So then you'll have to take an account for that too. If you're in a Midwest market, like Nebraska or something, you might be able to ask for some decent money at Warner Trucking, 
because there just isn't anybody else <laughs> there. You know, you can call the, your own shots, but you know, if you get into New York and you get into Atlanta, you get into even here, uh, LA, you're going to have a problem. Uh, you'll have to be competitive uh, and, and, and know how to negotiate. I, I find that a lot of people, even who I hire, um, I want to give them pointers on negotiation, but that wouldn't be fair. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I think for us at Nudesic, we're, we're pretty fair. Uh, we're probably above average just because of the consultancy part of things. Um, we, you know, to absorb that, we just charge more uh, or absorb it. Um, so there's a lot of advantages for having somebody else pay for a person. <laughs> Hey guys, I want to I want to keep this question going for a minute because it's there's an important thing in there which is about getting your first UX job, which is yeah. the first one's always the hardest. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna kick it. Let's Shannon. I'm gonna ask you this first, but we can kind of go around the horn if we want to. Um, what are the what makes what helps somebody break through? If you're like, in what circumstances are you gonna take that first time person and say, we're gonna take a shot on this? What did they do that gets them? to get your attention and to actually land that job? Um, for someone who doesn't have a lot of UX job experience on their resume, as long as they have a strong portfolio to show strong design thinking can kind of get your foot in the door. Um, we don't often post uh, like in low level UX roles. Actually, the more I've seen lately has been like mostly bringing people in as interns and then that kind of fills in the lower level roles. So it, it can be difficult, but at the same time, we've definitely had a big surge in wanting to have a really diverse and inclusive design community. And in that case, like having people who, have, who haven't taken a traditional route into UX or who have kind of a diverse background or diverse um, job experience can be really interesting. So if, if it seems like it could be interesting, if they can tell a story around it and if the portfolio is strong, we usually at least talk to them. Anybody else want to chip in on that one? Like what helps uh, get a first timer get noticed and get a break? Yeah, so this is Alan. I would echo on the portfolio, but the portfolio doesn't need to be polished. It just needs to show your critical thinking or your design process. I want to see how you have a problem and how you broke that problem out and how you came to the final solution. If everything is just high-end polished uh, assets, it, um, sometimes it, I might question if, if you really have the core knowledge to be able to start from a problem on your own and get to the solution. Um, I might bring you in for an interview or just do a phone screen and see if the conversation matches what I, what I read off the portfolio. Um, but I think the number one thing is just to be yourself. Don't, don't try and answer a question to try and please me. Just try and be yourself. And if you're applying for a specific role, um, most of my most of my roles that I've hired on, they're they're not necessarily unicorn type roles. They're specialist roles. So I'll hire a researcher, and I want someone with research or psychology experience. I'll hire, you know, an interaction designer role. I need someone who's going to be able to, you know, break down complex problems and start coming up with some solutions. Don't have a generalist resume and apply for a specialist role. Because that, that right away turned me off to a bunch of resumes and portfolios. That's good. If you right? are, yeah, if you are applying for both roles, make sure that you have two different resumes, right? Especially if you don't know which way you want to go with your career, um, I would consider doing that. I was, I was going to recommend exactly what Alan just said. If you have strengths in several areas of UX uh, and you're going to apply for roles that are specialty roles, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having multiple resumes that describe the same locations that you were at, maybe even the same projects, but you give them either a research bent or designer bent or architect bent, whatever you want. Um, exceptional, and, I, and I've used that as a practice myself. It's hard to tell if others are using that because you can't see what's behind the scenes. Um, but I could tell when you, somebody has kind of made sure they call out. Also from a getting notice, you've got to remember most of this stuff is done with several screening mechanisms before they ever get into our hands. So knowing keywords that are in the 
the job rec itself need to be in those resumes too. So if you have experience with five different tools, you know, Figma and Sketch, and but the but but you've touched Adobe XD, but you don't have that in your in your resume, make sure you get that into your resume for the role that's asking specifically for an XD person. Um, <laughs> portfolio, can't stress that enough that it shouldn't be polished. Again, I agree with both Shannon and Al Alan on that. The only thing I wanted to add to what Matthew said earlier about um, job and location, know that some locations have different tiers. Um, so if you are in the in the space that you are growing your career and you have the flexibility to move, um, know that some tiers, like like we're the same tier as San Diego. That blew me away when I started to look at the San Diego market, um, uh, where their cost of living is higher versus the San Francisco Bay Area, which is several tiers above us as far as scale. So um, when you're looking at a large entity, like I'm at Intel now building a team, um, where you're at is really going to matter on how you get paid. So we have offices in San Jose that are paying differently than the offices in Chandler, Arizona. I think there's three things and you they all hit on it. I think about billability or hireability or value of any sort. You have three things. You have availability, you have skill, and you have proof. And I might even add perceived proof. So if you are showing portfolios and you're able to articulate your thought process like alan said and 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 be able to explain why i came up with it if you even explained it in a way that i don't agree with you but at least i know why you went through it and did that um you know what was what was the what was the goal of it in the first place a lot of people forget about that they come out of it and say well i, I it was cleaner it was nicer looking it was this and that and it was like well what was the re why was it the in the first place why was it um done and a lot of times when you don't have a purpose to do something and you are just kind of creating portfolio pieces they don't have purpose they have purpose of getting a job so that's just be honest with it i've been practicing i've been working with this i've been doing a process of which i'm you know working through it and i'm doing it marginally okay, but I, I need to learn. I need to grow. Be honest. I had an interview yesterday or today. I don't remember. They all blurred together, but, um, you know, I just, I, I just felt disingenuous in the, from the very beginning. You don't have to boost yourself up and say, you're like the awesomest person in the world, right? You just be real, like Shannon was saying, and, um, you know, get your skill sets up in a 100, 200, 300 level, 100 being tools, 200 being methods, 300s being strategies. And if you want to get all the way to a 400 level of industry or, or verticals, you know, you know a lot about um, hospital, uh, hospitality maybe, you know, and, and you maybe worked in hospitality and that's kind of how it spawned you to get your job. And then you're like, well, now I'm learning methods of which hospitality works, right? So I love listening to where you came from. I, I don't, I actually think the UX stuff is kind of boring when, I, when I'm listening to your story and how you got there. I wanna hear that you worked at Circuit City. I wanna hear that you worked at a tire center. I wanna hear that you worked those places because to me, that's a life experience and you've already experienced so many things that maybe somebody that's only been doing school has only learned academia. It's like, if I have an, you know, academia kind of project, you're probably perfect for it, you know, but I want to hear a lot of those life skills in, inside of that, that interview. How'd you know I worked at Circuit City? <laughs> oh, <fuck> <laughs> you, <dude. laughs> and I worked at a tire center. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Hey, so let, let's hit, there's a couple of questions that have piled up here. Let's can can I just add one little small part to what, what Matthew said? And that's just the ability to tell a story, I think is what you're kind of saying in there. Yeah, the exactly. ability to articulate things. You are, you are going to be convincing people. I remember being in an interview once and somebody said, my favorite part about UX is arguing my point with people. And I went, oh my gosh, <laughs> no. Like, why, why is arguing your favorite part? Um, so you got to be able to persuade. So having at okay. least the ability to, to really talk and just describe a thing is good. Yeah. I love right. being an ornery person. <laughs> <laughs> Hire <Well>, me. <laughs> 
wrong share. All right, so I have to take uh, a minute then. Guys, I mentioned that there's more in this deck besides what we covered. So in order, you know, things around getting noticed, there's a whole section of like the types of things, like where to be and things to do. And around the interviews, like this whole concept we were just talking about, I tried to make this as simple as possible, like what to include in your portfolio when you're telling a story, the things that we're going to look for. And there's actually, a, I think, a really good article out here by good old Jared Spool about that interview process that's linked to in here that you can start to see the manager's mindset to help you prepare. Um, it's, you know, the, so trying to move on to a couple of these questions, like yeah. the, the number of, there's, there's a couple of things here, like the number of case studies. Does, does the number of case studies matter to you guys? My res that in this case, they only have two. Would that be a turnoff that there's only two? I think it's enough. For me, I, I, I'll hire a bum off the street and teach them. Like that's the thing is I, I'm so like, if they're available, the availability is the most important for me. If they're never around, I can't do anything with them. And so at least if they're there, I can teach them to do anything, right? So, but I think a couple is good, couple three. I would want to see more than two. Yeah, I, I think so. I would want to see at least four, um, but I don't need to see any more than that, um, yeah. if that helps. Um, and it is, it is quality, definitely. Like if they're two really good ones and the other things have clicked, you know, the conversations we have would put you over the, the top. But I think it depends on the role that you're applying for. If you're applying for a more senior position, I'd expect to see more detail and more case studies in your portfolio and resume. So, so two points with that, uh, the, the quantity is not that important. I'd go with quality too, but to be able to tell the story in that case study is so important. I, I never get past two when I do include, um, uh, you know, let's go through a portfolio review or, or case study review. I won't get through two anyway. So knowing they're there is kind of just kind of weighing the report. Did it feel like they did something here? Um, because there's no way I'm getting through four during a, a presentation, but, but I wanted to add, also, what I'd like to see in a case study, if you have one, is business value. Um, if somebody does not have in there, it's not a tick against you, but there's so much to be said when you look at somebody's uh, case study and you could actually see how that relates to the business um, through some type of metric or several. I, I agree. Hey, Shannon, I think this question was aimed at you. Are the internships paid? But for anybody, like, is there an expectation that, that if you do take an inter internship, you'll get paid? I know that internships we have at GoDaddy are. So all of our internships are definitely paid and not only paid, but we make sure like everything you do in your inter internship is real. Like you better be shipping stuff during your time, even though it's only eight weeks or we didn't do our job of getting you the right experience in your internship. So yeah, absolutely. Like you, sh you should be getting paid for your internship. But I mean, if you need to get an internship to get something on your resume, you, you may have to get an unpaid one, but all the ones I've seen have been paid. That's the general, yeah, I think that's the general consensus. Um, and then how important is it to have a UX degree? Um, can you get into this field with a portfolio and a good resume and good conversations, but maybe you're an English major? I think a degree is one route in, but only one route and there's lots of other ones. Um, and I've Thanks. talked to many people who have come in in other ways, uh, you know, even just a graphic design background and they've started and maybe along the way they felt like they wanted some additional training and might've taken some courses in UX to kind of bolster kind of their own like natural talent in it. But you certainly don't need that. You just need to show, you know, the design thinking that you're already starting. That's that proof part. Proof comes from a lot of places. You just hit another question there too. Somebody asked if I have a graphic design background or that's my experience, or if I'm an artist and I wanna be a UX designer, are there paths there? Absolutely. I actually, so one of the junior designers at GoDaddy that I mentor, she started as a graphic designer, fantastic visual designer. And now she's really developing into this um, like design system thinker and watching her evolution has been amazing. But yeah, she absolutely started. I think she was doing um, like, I think she was doing some cartooning at some point, like it all started in graphic design and then it's evolved from there. And um, so absolutely that's a path in. I want to clarify the question. I think it's, do you have to have graphic design experience? Oh, thank you. You're right. Oh. <laughs> so um, let's 
to, to, to answer that one too, there's so many areas in UX. There are certainly areas that don't even touch the UI. So you could absolutely go into more of a research role, more of an architect role. Um, can, you put, can you put together squares, uh, you know, and circles? Then you could wireframe. So uh, absolutely not. And, and that might be one of those takes for uh, a corporate kind of position where you have more specialty, maybe the in-house where you have more specialty positions where it's not all relying on you to do everything from start to finish. And you could say, hey, we have bid design. We could just hand this over. They will make it pretty. They will do it precise, pixel perfect, all that fun stuff. I've gotten to a point in my career, I don't touch that stuff as much as I used to because I don't have the time to, to tweak the little designs. So yeah, I don't think you need to even be close to a graphics background or an art background to join. It's like 20% of the whole thing probably. But if you start there, if you are creative and you have good aesthetics and color theory and all that stuff, like uh, Shannon said, you can teach them to do the other things. It's probably harder to teach a researcher to be good at that others, you know, that other stuff. Um, if they're not, their heart isn't in it, or they just, you know, just if we could teach developers it. to open up sketch and draw boxes, <laughs> I know we could teach somebody else. So probably, yeah, I, it, probably it's right. A, it's a learned behavior. It's, yeah, it's not I was thinking more branding and things like that, you know, really Absolutely. getting into it. Awesome. Anybody want to tackle that content question uh, for the writers, people coming into UX through the writing? So I have someone on my team and her sole purpose is uh, to help author help content. So we're using a platform called Pendo. It gathers user analytics, but you, know, you could also build um, user guides and walkthrough guides for content. So having that um, English background and those writing skills are very helpful to help break down something complicated and walk a user through that process. For the writers out there, like in my, I've been in the agency world twice in my career, very early on, and then just more recently, right before I came to GoDaddy. Um, the difference in positions the second time it came around, we went from having like tech writers or copywriters, creative writers, into now content strategists and content marketers. And it's, it is a, to me, it's, it's an amazing position. Like the first time I watched our content strategists go to work, they were doing empathy mapping. They were doing journeys. They were doing the same kind of things that we do to develop that customer story and that focus. And then they were making the leap into the narrative. Um, you know, the, the, it goes hand in hand with the design. Um, and the thing that I would say is you're going to find, um, pockets in design teams and design organizations and engineering where there's writers. But if, if that's your passion is the writing and you're wondering about how this kind of goes with UX, I would say look up content strategy and content marketing because um, you may find a really neat career path there that takes a lot of what we're talking about and blends those two together. Also, if you really want to get crazy, you can go and start doing content trees for um, Alexa and, and all the other things. Stop, stop, stop. So, you know. A strange, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no it, that's it. <clears throat> the other place I've seen a couple of people that came from writing kind of backgrounds and ended up in a, in a UX um, adjacent kind of role is in the accessibility areas where you have learning disabilities, um, uh, cognitive disabilities, um, English as a second language kind of uh, uh, items. So, uh, language becomes really important when you have apps that get used by quite a few people with a wide spectrum of, of you know, we think of disabilities in terms of maybe vision or, or auditory or things like that, but there are, there's so many more people that have uh, more attention and, and, and cognitive type items and, and writing becomes so key um, in that. If you think of it from a banking standpoint, uh, terms and conditions are super long. How do you make that uh, when somebody's on maybe uh, uh, has some kind of a cognitive disability so that they don't lose attention, um, phrases, all those fun things. Something to consider. 
There's an interesting question in there about um, the level of detail you like to see in a portfolio case study versus what you'd like to hear as they come into the interview and tell their stories. Is there a difference in the amount of content or the, you know, what's presented in your minds, what you'd like to see in one place versus the other? Well, during that, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> during a portfolio review, like we definitely want to see um, the details, but they need to be presented kind of we were already talking about just like in a really um, easy to follow story. And the more like clean and clear and concise you can you can make it to to keep everybody's attention and to help us follow along through through um, your examples are um, are really important. Uh, you you can you know you can put a little bit more content into an act like an online um, portfolio because we can kind of skim it and and look through and read as much as we want. But in a presentation, when you have several people that you're kind of trying to explain it to, I think you need to be a little bit more concise, and then people can ask more questions if they want to know more. It's like an informational uh, an informational presentation that. Um, if you, you got to gear it towards a CIO type position, bullet points type things, very, you know, easily skimmable. If you give me a book, I'm going to be pretty annoyed by it. Um, I probably won't read it, but um, that's just. I got to ask you guys, do you guys still do design challenges for some of your key UX positions? Every time. Yep. I don't, this but I know they still are out there. I was recently on the job market and I hit a couple of them. We I don't know if it, it is like define job challenges. It like go off and do something and come back, or is it more like let's challenge. listen to your listen to your like let's we'll get on a miro board and and work through a problem. Okay. Yeah, get on the board and work through a problem. And you know, it's when I run these, it's not about completing it. It's just about the thought process and how you break things down or how you segment it. And then when they meet some of the other team members that they'd work on, they get to present and communicate part of their design thinking. So not only is it an exercise in the critical thinking and their core skill set, it's an exercise in communication, right? Because you always have to help onboard your designs, so to speak, with engineers or other staff. So I have a couple of things to add. I'll, I'll start with you, Alan, with that. Um, so I was I was in the job market recently. I had two different kind of uh, design challenges. One, which was, uh, we're going to present you a problem, go off on your own for an hour, come back onto the bridge with, with your solution, but all of the logic and design thinking that you, or at least not design thinking, but at least um, uh, describe the process you went through. Um, I also had one where they actually set up uh, folk users I had to interview them. I had to gather an understanding. Uh, they had a business stakeholder that came in. I had to interview them. And then I had to take some of that um, and, and digest it and work with another designer to come up with a solution. So that was all in real time. It was a two hour exercise. Um, so there is wow. a wide spectrum when you, when you talk about design challenges. Um, yeah, I, I guess it depends on the level of the position you're applying for. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, to, to go to the portfolios, there are legit reasons why you would not be able to describe a lot of what is in your history in a portfolio, too. Um, I've recently uh, interviewed a person who has been working for the DOD for years and has top clearance, has worked on some spectacularly cool sounding projects. I have not seen a screen <laughs> uh, in any of them. Uh, so uh, there are there are there's got to be a balance uh and this maybe is addressing you know the hiring managers on there of what we see versus what somebody's experience is and on the other side don't fear that um not being able to to have a a, a huge portfolio especially if you're early in your career you're not going to have that you're going to have to show some of your academia stuff in there um but uh know that being able to tell the story and how you come up with your designs, how you do your research, how you, um, what your design process is, is more important to me than what I'm seeing as finished looking products uh, in a portfolio. All right, two minute warning. Um, there was a question up there about the um, unicorns. 
uh, an agency. So the way to interpret that, like designer, developer, UX architect, like you, you're going to have all tester, researcher, all of these different things in one person. The reason I brought that up around the agencies is that you typically it's a smaller team and you're deployed out to a client. You need to have many hats. So, you know, whether unicorns exist, that's a fun one. That's another meetup. <laughs> uh, we can talk about that. It'd be fun. But the point is you will have probably more demand to use many different types of skills on an account and be called upon to do that. Whereas on the in-house and on the enterprise, you're going to see more specialized positions, kind of like Cody told us earlier. Um, they have the bigger budgets, bigger teams, so they can get a researcher with a certain niche or they can get a designer with a certain focus, um, you know, whatever that may be. Um, so that's kind of, hopefully that helps answer the, the difference. And um, I was being cheeky with the unicorns, but you do have like, <laughs> you can learn all the different things and you should probably know a lot of things like that eventually when you're m more in the architect level, but you're going to fall short on something. There is no unicorn all the way quality, all the way at the top. You know, there will be something you will skip. There will be a process part that you'll skip and just to get through it, right? But you got you got trade-offs that you have to work with. Awesome. Want to do one more? Yeah, you can do as many as you want. I don't know, until the people well, die. If <laughs> you got to go. I'm just, just going to honor everybody's time, yeah. including my own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there's a research one. So let's, because we had a lot of design and, and developers. So when submitting, this is interesting too, when submitting a UX research portfolio, any preference between having a case study that's on a website versus a deck that's, you know, got maybe more of a, a focused kind of uh, run through from a presentation standpoint? Does one or the other have a preference to you? Any pros or cons? To me, it's all shaking. about the content. It's the content. There we go. Generally, Not what I see is there's like, there is a website version that you kind of look at that's attached to the resume. And then when you come in after a screening and you're going to give like a full, like full, full length interview, that's when you bring in the, the slide deck with a lot more details. And, and that's where like you can really tell your story. Oh. All right. Um, I'm going to take the deck and get it onto SlideShare and send that to Matt. So the awesome. link can go out. It'll probably be tomorrow, honestly. Uh, I'm going to join Alan and start drinking wine as soon as we're done here. <laughs> um, but the, uh, yeah, we'll definitely make that I'm available. Done. There you go. I'm done. <laughs> Alan does not share. It's like getting smaller and smaller as you get started. <laughs> <laughs> you guys I'm like got, leaning back more and more. You got, you got Shannon's <laughs> contact info. You can find the rest of us out there on LinkedIn or at these meetups. We're all kind of connected through that as well. But these are great, great questions. I can tell we've got, we've got a, a smart bunch who's really thinking about this. Hopefully we gave you some great things to help with your decisions on your job search. Um, you know, what to think about, what kind of companies to go for, know what you're getting into, and then be better in tune with what's going to get that manager's attention and the kind of conversations you want to have. Um, Matt, thanks so much for having us Thank tonight. You. And to you thanks. guys who joined, um, you know, it's great being on this panel with you. Next month, we're going to have Annika. She's going to do some, actually, some writing, <laughs> uh, content uh, writing uh, meetups uh, or a meetup content or meetup story. Um, I also make sure, I, I know there's still a lot of like um, questions. Go over to Discord, join Discord, and I'll create a, like a channel for like UX noob questions or whatever, and just start putting those questions in there, and we'll get all of us to keep answering them and throughout you know forever. Um, I will uh, I will get you a Discord link if you haven't gotten it, so I'll just be on the lookout. Um, I'll message this the people that are on this this group again. I think I did earlier, so if you may want to go back in the emails or something but um yeah thank you for for tony for doing this it was really awesome great all right thanks everybody it was Good a night. pleasure everyone thank you thank you thanks